journeys. Okay, James, the second chapter, my subtitle tonight does have a question mark on purpose. The subtitle is Justified by Works, and I started with no question mark, and then I wanted to put the question mark in for two reasons. One, James does, and two, I wanted the whoever looks at these titles not to be confused because you don't have to watch us listen, you don't have to listen to us very long to know that I do not believe you're justified by your works. In fact, I think the foundation of the new covenant rests on us being justified apart from the law. Apart from, and what is the law if not the barometer of works under the old covenant? So I put the question mark because that's how James does it, and we're really examining the book of James and why he wrote what he wrote. So I start here in much the same manner I started almost every Hebrews study. Remember, we would open Hebrews by say, every week by saying, this book was written so that your hearts might be established in grace. So I, write, I say this, James is written to the 12 tribes scattered, to Jews very explicitly to Jews, whom he believed knew Christ, but he doesn't make that a real point in his book. He's not. You could make an argument that he's really concerned with Jews being good Jews. Jesus is sort of a side thought to that in the book of James. And we've went through this over the weeks. The reason for that is James very early in the church history. Paul has probably written none of his letters at the time this letter is penned. In fact, very possible Paul's not even saved. He's a Jew, a Pharisee, but he's maybe not a Christian yet. So James is, is the leading voice. He, him and Peter are the leading voices of the early church. Paul is, and I'm going to get to this as we close tonight, but I want to do a little examination of how Paul would have been viewed by James. We always try to look at it how James would have been viewed by Paul. Well, that's easy. Paul's got more letters. The, half the book of Acts follows Paul. But we want to see how, how Paul might have been viewed by James, and we'll do that as we, as we close tonight. So let's start in the 14th verse. This is where we ended in 13. Was it last week? I oh, don't know. It wasn't. I think it was a couple weeks ago. I lose track of time. But we ended in 13. We are going to finish the second chapter tonight, although I don't want to read it all right away. I do want to read a few verses. Let's start 14, at least 14, 15, and 16. What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, Depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? Now, he asks a lot of questions. We'll help, I think, they're pretty easy to answer. We're going to do that as we go. But let's start in that, start at the start, 14th verse. What does it profit if someone says they have faith but they don't have works? Then this crucial question, can faith save him? So I ask you the question James asks his audience. Asks his audience can faith save you? And so think about James's question Think about how we are used to that question being answered through the New Testament. And then consider Ephesians chapter 2. Ribbon, James 2, and we'll come back. Ephesians chapter 2, Paul, I know we're dealing with a whole different writer. Paul will say this in what is the most succinct definition of salvation that I can find in the New Testament in regards to the work of grace and the work of faith. Ephesians 2, 8. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. So according to Paul in, in Ephesians 2, 8, what is it that saves you? It is by grace you have been saved through your faith. So 
People will say, well, we're going to argue semantics. I don't think so. I'm going to show you why. It is grace that does the saving. It is the grace of God that saves you. It is faith that activates the saving grace of God. So what Paul is saying is that it's grace that did the work, but it's your faith that caused grace to do the work. It's by grace through faith. So think of by one through the agency of another. So we could definitely say you wouldn't be saved without faith. Why? Because grace is activated by your faith. But what if you simply had faith? You wouldn't be saved. Why? Because grace is what we are saved by. So it's really an incomplete statement to say that faith saves me. Because grace is what does the saving but faith activates the grace. So it's safe to say James doesn't have a full revelation of the grace of God. Now, go back to James. James 2.14, can faith save him? Based upon Ephesians 2 and 8, it can save him, but it doesn't do it by itself. What if you have faith in the wrong God? What if you have faith in the wrong truth? Truth. What you consider to be truth. There are people that have faith in themselves. Is faith in yourself going to save you? No. There are people that have faith in their education, their talent, their ability, their money. None of those things save them. Why? Because it's not that we have faith, but what we have faith in. This is why the message of grace is flat and hopeless if it is a doctrinal message. But if it is a person-based message in which Jesus is the object of the message of grace, then people don't have faith in a doctrine. People have faith in a man, and his name is Jesus. Right? So when James says, can faith save him? If you didn't read any further, you would think James is on a grace trip, going to say, you're going to need grace. But when you read further, you find out that James is going to talk to you for a little bit about what you do. So James is going to marry two ideas in this chapter. He's going to marry the idea of spoken faith, and he's going to marry the idea of works performed. And he's going to put those two together as the basis for the salvation of man, that he speaks faith and that he works faith, and that if he speaks faith but doesn't work out his faith, then he doesn't really have faith at all. This will be James' argument. And you could amen that for the most point, for most points and say, you can't just say it. You're going to do it. You're going to be it. We're going to find, though, that James takes it to what Paul would consider an extremely uncomfortable level before you get through with the chapter. So I really leave it up to you how you interpret James 2.14. Why not? You have your own. You have a Bible. You have the Holy Spirit inside of you. I leave it to you how to interpret James' question, can faith save him? I think James' answer is no, it can't. He needs to do more than that. Most everybody in this room answered yes, we believe faith can save us. Then when we all looked at Ephesians 2.8, we found out why we think faith can save us. And it could have been a trick question, because by itself, faith won't do you any good. But it's the object of your faith that does you good. And so faith placed in Christ and who he is, of course, works. But James takes it to a practical level. If you see someone naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to him, depart in peace, be warmed, be filled, but you don't give him the things that he needs, what does it profit him? So basically it's this. We've used this illustration before. You're speaking grace, you're quoting scripture, You're talking about being a believer, and then you encounter someone that needs you. Maybe they need a dollar. Maybe they need a meal. Maybe they need a shoulder to cry on. And you say to them, be blessed. Grace to you. And you walk on. Did you do them any good? Not for what they needed. Now, you leave feeling good because you think, well, I blessed them. But you didn't bless them at all. If the guy's hungry and he says, I I just need food, and you say, well, God bless you, and you walk on, what does he think care about your God? 
God meant to bless him. That's why he walked you in front of him. And it wasn't so you could say, God bless you. Any heathen could have said, God bless you. And believe it or not, any heathen could feed him a meal. And what I found is a lot of heathens will. You can call them heathens all you want, but they were agents of the Spirit in that moment. And I believe God will use a sinner if he has to. If he'll speak through a donkey, he'll use an unbeliever if they'll just open their bowels of compassion. James makes an important point. You can talk about faith all day, talk a big game. But what good does it do you to just verbally bless somebody and not actually bless somebody? I've always said it this way. It's sort of like the Christian cop-out, I'll be praying for you. The Christian cop-out, I'll be praying for you. It's not that every time we say to someone, I'll be praying for you, we're copping out. Sometimes you literally have nothing else that you can possibly do but pray. Not that it's the worst thing or the least thing, but it's literally all I've got. What I can pray for you, I can believe for you, I can cry with you, I can hurt with you. But how many of you also know that sometimes somebody's not looking for you to pray for them, they're looking for you to help them. And some, a lot of us have gotten used to copping out in that moment by just saying, well, I'll be praying for you, and we just walk on and don't do anything. What kind of world would we live in if every time we found someone in need, the best thing we gave them was, here's our church card, come down here Sunday and hear our pastor. He's really good. What kind of world would we live in? Well, we'd live in a world with a bunch of cards laying on the ground. Because that's exactly where they'd end up, is on the ground, because that didn't feed my hungry belly coming down there to hear your good pastor on Sunday, right? Or meeting your God, or hearing of your grace, whatever. So James is basically saying, what good would it do? Uh, I, I think we've wasted a lot more time in the church talking about and developing our faith lingo than we have using it. We spend an enormous amount of time as Christians talking up Christianity, memorizing verses, getting doctrine, coming up with clever revelations, stuff other people haven't seen. And then it's no practical use in the world a lot of times to people. To a world lost and dying, a lot of Christians have gotten used to walking right past them, turning the other way, God, get me out of here. This world's going to hell. I, I just need you to come back and get me, Jesus. And all the while, he walked you right past the very people that Jesus destined us to make a difference in their lives. The very people that Jesus never turned in prayer and said, Father, will you get me out of here? I am, I am tired of the rabble of the world. But instead went straight to them. Realized that he had something worth sharing. And I fear that we've spent so much time developing, air quotes here, proper doctrine in the church. We've spent so much time honing our faith and getting the lingo right and so little time being the difference makers on planet Earth. If James makes a good point, it's this. Stop talking faith and start walking faith. It's a great point. Stop just saying how good God is and start showing someone how good God is. I want to challenge you, church, to pray this way at least once this week. God, I don't want to talk a game today. I don't care if I quote a verse. I don't need to try to win one person to Jesus. Father, today, I want to live the gospel in one person's life. And here's your real challenge. Father, I want to live the gospel in one person's life, and I want to do it without quoting one scripture or referencing one book I just read or mentioning one sermon I just heard. Father, help me to do that. I want to learn how to live out all the stuff I'm learning in. Doesn't it seem like we've, we're piling up learning on issues? What do you think about this? What's your opinion on this? How do you interpret this verse? And then so little giving it back out. So James is making a crucial point. Let's do more with it than just saying, hey, God bless you. Seventeen. Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. The Greek here would be close to the phrase, faith by itself would be like a corpse. Okay, so we, we get the word, it's dead. So it would be like the body without the soul. It's just a shell. So James is saying faith 
without works is just itself a shell. Based on context, I say amen. Based on context, I say amen. Because what's the context? The context is you see a guy in need, and all you do is say to him, God bless you. And James says, here's what you can do with your God bless you. That what, that's basically what it, he says. Your God bless you is as useless as a dead body. Because what your God bless you did was nothing. You just felt better about yourself for walking right on past the world in desperate need of help. And all you gave him was doctrinal, was a shallow doctrine. Okay? So within context, I, again, I say Amen. Faith without works is dead. What's the context? As far as helping my next door neighbor, faith without works is dead in regards to helping my next door neighbor. Could we agree? But James doesn't stop there. And here's where James takes it to a level, and I, God loving James is so much like so many of us preachers. He has a good doctrinal point, and then he stretches it. And before he's done with it, he takes it to a level that Paul not only wouldn't take it to, but would work all of his ministry and lose his life, literally. We'll get to why Paul would die eventually. Would be persecuted and martyred in defense of a doctrine that was so anti what James had to say. I want to warn you, okay, at, at 20 minutes into tonight, 15 minutes into teaching, all right? I want to warn you that the area I'm about to walk into, if you are someone who cannot listen to a teacher or preacher say that there are con contradictory arguments in the Bible. If you can't stand that because you think it's an attack against the validity of the Word, stop the feed now. Turn the CD off, eject it, throw it out because you will not want the next two-thirds of the sermon. And the reason I'm giving you that warning is there are people that cannot stand the idea of a Bible teacher or preacher or pastor or whoever, whomever saying that there's an issue in the Bible that we should take issue with something someone said because a lot of people say there are no contradictions, there are no problems, there are no errors. And I say to you, you haven't been reading very long or you haven't been reading very smart. Now, I don't mean to hurt anybody's feelings, but there is no way that you can read the book of Acts where Paul circumcises Timothy. And then you can read the book of Galatians where Paul tells you that if you circumcise, you are a debtor to keep the whole law and tell me that there are not problems within the text of the New Testament, not even counting Old Testament being fulfilled by New. That gives you a whole bevy of stuff. I mean, we've got a whole lot of Old Testament says this, New Testament says this. I can keep you just inside the framework of Matthew to Revelation and give you a couple handfuls of stuff you got to really think about. Now, why is that? Don't be dismayed if you st stuck with me on the CD or, the, or the, the feed long enough. Don't be dismayed. Don't be disheartened. It's not an attack against the validity of the Word. It's showing you the humanity of the writers. And it also ought to be very encouraging to you. It's okay that we don't have it all figured out yet. And it's okay to write before you have it all figured out. And it's okay to witness before you have it all figured out. And it's okay to preach before you have it all figured out. Because you're, you're going to learn something tomorrow that you didn't know today. And the one thing you're going to want to do in life is always be pliable and teachable and change your mind. How many of you just love talking to people that never change their mind? How many of you just say, you know what I love about this guy is no matter how much new information comes down the pipe, he stays steady as a rock. He'll never change his mind. We think it's admirable until we meet it. Everybody I've ever known goes, I just want people that believe what they believe and they stick with their guns until you meet that guy. And then there's irrefutable evidence placed in front of that guy and he will not back off. And you go, you know what? Those people aren't near as smart as I thought they were. Okay, 
Don't be discouraged that the Bible is full of real people who have a development curve. If you don't trust what I'm saying, read the book of Acts with an open mind. In the early part of the book, Peter won't preach to anybody that's not a Jew. In the middle of the book, Peter figures out it's okay to preach to people that aren't Jews. By the end of the book, there's no more Peter. God left him. Not God left him, but the story left him. God wanted the rest of the world to get the gospel, so he quit telling you about the gospel to the Jews because 99% of the world's not Jewish. So God said, I'm going to follow the guy that's going to take the gospel to the Gentiles. There's all kinds of moments of development. So I, I said all of that for this reason. You're about to see a blatant, in-your-face, slap-you-sideways contradiction in the New Testament. You're about to see one New Testament writer say one thing, and then we're going to flip our Bible over to the New Testament, and you're going to see another New Testament writer say the exact opposite of what this writer says. So if you think there's contradictions cause you to close your Bible, close it now. Don't ever open it again. But if you're willing to understand that people come into a revelation knowledge and they live inside the revelation that they have, and then they grow. And as they grow, they live inside the new revelation knowledge that they have. And then they grow and they live inside of that revelation knowledge that they have. I'll tell you what it'll help you do. It'll help you deal with all the people in your life that you don't think have got it. And it'll keep you from judging the people that seem to have something you don't have. Now, they may not be right. I'm not saying that every time somebody disagrees with you, you go, well, they've probably learned something I haven't learned. But it's a pretty good attitude to have of maybe there's more out there. Rather than just fighting, shutting everybody down that doesn't agree with me, maybe there's more out there. You know, Lord, I'm open. And I've been that way with all kinds of stuff. There's guys out preaching stuff, calling it grace, finished work. And I, I've said, Lord, I don't see it that way. If I ever see it that way, you'll have to show me. I'm not going to say it's wrong. I'm not going to say I won't. I'm just walking in the light I'm given. I read your word. I listen to the Spirit. I apply it to my life. I walk in the revelation I have. I can't walk in the revelation I don't have. And where we've gotten ourselves into some trouble is we just take blindly whatever somebody says that we respect and we walk in their revelation. And we'll actually argue for their revelation. We don't even have it. James, give him credit. He's going to teach and preach what he knows. Please remember this. It's, boy, you're really dragging getting into it. Yes, because this scripture has been so avoided by grace people and so chopped up, misused, and misapplied because we're scared to say what is so obvious. We're scared to say this guy's not on the same page with Paul. In fact, I heard a grace guy not too long ago teaching from James and said, no, there's no contradiction at all between Paul and James. Here's what James means and here's what Paul means. And I bought into that for a long time until I'm just staring at the scriptures going, there's no way around it. This guy and this guy don't think the same way. I don't believe there's a fight going on between them. I don't think James knows Paul's name yet when he writes this. And if he did, he saw the Christian killing Pharisee from Tarsus who's out to clean up the house of God. That was Paul's goal, clean up God's house. And so he's out killing all these rabble-rousing Christians. He's really doing a God a service. Jesus prophesied of that. Did you know Jesus prophesied of Paul? We'd like to think Jesus prophesied and said, there's one coming who's going to teach you things you've never known. No, he said, they're going to kill you and think they do God a service. That was Paul. It wasn't Paul yet, he was Saul. But Jesus prophesied about him. James says this, 18, someone will say, you have faith, I have works. Show me your faith without your works. I will show you my faith by my works. You believe there's one God, you do well. Even the de demons believe and do tremble. I'm going to deal with what I think James could mean here as we go, but I want to jump into this. But do you want to know, O oh foolish man, that faith without works is dead? That que that's a question. Do you want me to prove it to you, he says, that faith without works is dead? Remember, I, thought, I think his faith without works dead argument within context was pretty good. I think he's already had a good metaphor. A guy is poor and destitute and needs food. You walk up and say, God bless you. And he goes, how dare you? Faith without works is dead. Good metaphor. Don't bring Abraham into it. But bless God, that's where we're going. So James goes farther and says, 21, was not Abraham our father justified by works 
when he offered his son Isaac on the altar. Do you see that faith was working together with his works and by works faith was made perfect? The Greek word there is faith was made complete. And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. We're going to stop right there for a moment. James quotes the book of Genesis, in fact. He goes all the way back to Abraham, and he asks you a pointed question in verse 21. Was not Abraham our father justified by works? Scriptural evidence, 23. Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him for righteousness. Put your ribbon there and go to Romans chapter 4. I'm going to do this quickly because I don't want you to forget what James said, and I don't want you to forget the tone and tenor, and I don't want you to forget the verse he quoted. Romans chapter 4, verse 1. What should we then say about Abraham our father that he has found according to the flesh? If Abraham was justified by works, then he would have something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the Scripture say? What verse do you think Paul's going to use? The exact same verse. Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him for righteousness. Now to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace. They're counted as debt. We'll stop right there for a moment. Guys, there's no way around it. There is no way around what you just saw unless you hack, cut, paste, move, add context, act like the Bible has guys that are all on the same page all the time in the exact same amount of spiritual development. You are not dealing with that kind of book. You are dealing with a book of men writing down their revelation and you're watching that revelation explode and expand and all you got to do is read the book of Acts and watch James and Paul come out on two separate sides of the same issue and you'll realize... Not that God was mad at one and loved the other one, but that there's a development of walking in the grace of God by which you grow. And that's not a bad thing. That's a thing to be expected. So what's Paul's conclusion? Guys, it's the exact opposite of James's conclusion. What did James say? Our father Abraham was justified by works. How does Paul open the fourth chapter of Romans? What shall we say then about Abraham according to his flesh? He was, if he was justified by his works, verse 2, then he has something to boast about, but he can't boast about it before God. Who's he going to boast about it before? All the other work keepers. But instead, verse 3, Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. It's amazing to me. It is amazing to me that these two guys use the same verse and come up with a different solution. But don't be shocked, because it still happens today. I I find this encouraging, not discouraging. I really do. I find it encouraging that God allows us to get an insight into men whose doctrine falters from time to time. By the time... I don't want you to turn there, because we did this way back on the very first night we did James. By the time you get to Acts 21... Paul shows up in Jerusalem and James corners him and says, we've heard that you've been going all over the world telling people to apostatize away from Moses. He uses the word apostasy. It's big. To a Jew, nothing was bigger. Here's the truth. Paul was doing that. Everywhere Paul went, he was telling people, you're not bound by the law of Moses. All things are lawful for you, but not all things are expedient. You have to keep the law. Jesus fulfilled the law. Your righteousness comes by faith. He gets to Jerusalem and James corners him on it and says, we've been hearing it say, said that you're going all over the world telling people that they can apostatize from Moses. Well, Paul, you you can't do this. In fact, to, to convince everybody that you're not doing that, we want you to go to the temple and we want you to perform Moses' rites of cleansing and purification. There's four young converts there and we want you to go in there and do that for them so that everybody can tell and say, no, Paul's not doing that. And you know, you expect when you're reading that chapter, if something, if you haven't read it a while, you expect Paul to go, bless God, I'll never do that. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. There's no way I'm going to go. Instead, that's not what Paul does. He goes to the temple. He shaves his head. He does Moses' rite of purification. And he does it for the four young Jewish converts in the temple. 
and you're reading it, scratching your head, because by Acts 21, he's already wrote the book of Galatians. And you go, good grief, Paul, why did you back off? Why did he back off? Well, we can have theories, but I'm going to give you one that's pretty simple. He's human, and he wants people to like him. He wanted James's approval. You see, James is the pastor of the church at Jerusalem. For a Jew like Paul, a Pharisee of Pharisees, that's the head pastor in the denomination. That's the top, that's the big cheese, that's the chief. I just want him to like me. This guy was Jesus' earthly brother. I, I, if anybody could approve of my ministry, I want it to be James. I mean, he walked with the Lord. Paul has this slight inferior complex among all the apostles for two reasons. One, I'm one of the few that didn't see him in the flesh. And two, I killed their brothers. And I'm the least. When he says I'm the least of the apostles, he's telling you his heart. I'm the least, man. I'm, I don't belong in this group. I think he wants James to like him. He wants James to love him. He wants James to approve him. It doesn't work. He ends up in prison anyway because nobody buys into it. I think everybody even sees through how phony Paul was being by going in and doing this, and they're going, this isn't Paul. This isn't Paul. What's he doing this for? Again, I'm not trying to glory at his, his failure, but it kind of makes me feel better that every now and then, I'll admit, every now and then I want somebody to like me. I mean, every now and then you go, boy, just be nice if somebody cared. <laughs> and I say, Paul felt the same way. Now, if you want to see a guy that doesn't show a hint of that, go see Jesus. Just watch Jesus through the Gospels, and you, you're going to get a guy right there that, at risk of offending everybody in the room, would say what he heard Daddy say. Paul's not that guy. Jesus is that guy. This is why our gospel is not built on Paul. Our gospel is built on Jesus, who is the express image of the Father and whom there is no variableness, neither shadow of turning, as James said. So he didn't have... You, you wouldn't get... If you got in a time machine, went back and saw Jesus, don't worry, you wouldn't catch him on his off day. You know? Well, you saw a bad moment. How many of you might have an off day. You don't have to admit it. Nobody likes to admit it, but you might have an off day. I think Paul had a couple of those as well. We got a direct conflict. I, I can't leave it there, though. Let's just keep reading. You're in, you're in Romans 4. Just watch this. We're going we're gonna to re-sum up James's doctrine here in a moment. Verse 5, To him who does not work but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Did you catch that? There's Paul's direct rebuttal. He takes it a step further. He takes the same scripture James has, and he says, but for the man who does not work but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Church, don't ever forget Romans 4, 5. This is one of the most crucial pieces of information you'll ever need in your life. I'm going to read it for the third time. Look at this power. To the man who does not work but believes on him who justifies, is it godly people or ungodly people? That is incredible. God is not justifying godly people who do godly things. God is justifying ungodly people who believe on Jesus. What is counted for righteousness in that man? His faith. His faith is counted for righteousness. Just as David describes the blessedness of the man to whom God imputes righteousness apart from his works. And now Paul decides to quote more scripture. He quotes the 32nd Psalm. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord shall not impute sin. Does this blessedness then come upon the circumcised only or upon the uncircumcised also? For we say that faith was counted to Abraham for righteousness. How then was it counted? Was it counted when he was circumcised or when he was uncircumcised? Paul answers his own question. Not when he was circumcised, it was when he was uncircumcised. The act of circumcision did not bring Abraham into righteousness. He hadn't even been circumcised when God noticed his faith. And he received the sign of circumcision, which is a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had while 
while he was still uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all those who believe, though they are uncircumcised, that righteousness might be imputed to them also. And the father of circumcision to those who not only are of the circumcision, but also walk in the steps of the faith, which our father Abraham had while he was still uncircumcised. Here is the stunning fact that is often forgotten. God did not pick a Jew. God picked a Gentile. Turned him into what would be called a Jew. And he didn't wait until he became Jewish to justify him. He took him based upon faith, and then he gave him all of the promises that would be given to the Jews. Paul takes that approach in verse 13. For the promise that he would be heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. What's Paul mean? Abraham received his promise way before Mount Sinai in Exodus 19 and 20. We're quoting Genesis. We're not quoting Exodus. That's a span of hundreds of years. And Paul says Abraham was counted righteous way before God ever gave the law to Moses. So how could the law bring you righteousness if you admit Abraham was righteous? Now, James doesn't have a problem with that. What James has a problem with is saying that Abraham is righteous simply because he believed. James wants to see Abraham do something to prove he believes. So James doesn't say Abraham is righteous till he walks Isaac up the top of the mountain, lays him down on the altar, pulls the knife up in the air, and in that moment, James says, then his faith was perfect. Then you knew he was righteous because he would do what God told him to do. But what I think James misses, dare I say it, is James assumes that Abraham's faith is not perfect until he's willing to kill Isaac. But the reality is, the moment Abraham believed God, way back in Genesis 12, at that moment, the Bible says God counted him righteous. Believed God for what? Believed God enough to do what God said to do. Abraham, leave the land of your fathers and go into the land that I will show you. And the moment Abraham said, okay, God said, he's righteous. James didn't buy that. James didn't believe his true righteousness didn't come until he gets up on that mountain and he's about to sacrifice Isaac. At the end of James 2, he'll use Rahab the harlot. And that she's not really righteous because she receives the spies. She's righteous because of what she does. And yet, when she walks through their door, she says, everyone fears your God. Paul's argument would have been she would have never let him in the house if she didn't already believe. James says her belief isn't complete until she protects them or saves them. So I'll, I'll, I'll argue for the opposition for a moment. It is possible that James is really directing his argument, not at justification by faith, but that he's directing his argument to faith showing to your neighbor. Maybe James is saying, quit bragging about having faith. You're going to have to show somebody you have faith. Abraham, nobody knew he had faith. He's just walking around saying, God sent me here. And nobody knows that. But when he went up there to kill his own son, then they knew. And so people aren't going to know you have faith until they see you do something with it. Maybe that's James's argument. But my problem with standing by that as his argument is that he makes the blatant statement while quoting scripture, Abraham was justified by his works. For as it is written, Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. But that belief was not fulfilled until he sacrificed Isaac. And it's in that moment that I think Paul, if he were in the room, would have raised his hand and said, I'm sorry, but there's no comparison to righteousness by faith and righteousness by works. They cannot be party to one another. They cannot go hand in hand. They are two entirely different formulas. One is righteousness by the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Do, avoid. Do good, avoid bad. The other is righteousness by the tree of life. It is Him declaring you righteous simply by consumption, just by believing, just by receiving. That was the, the chief difference in the argument. So for James, and let's go back there. 
for James, there's a couple of things I want you to see. He says in verse 22, do you see that faith was working together with works and by works his faith was made perfect? By works, James' faith was made perfect. In this scenario, what has James elevated? He's elevated one above the other, and he's done it, I think, unwittingly. Works is the equipment it takes for faith to be made perfect. In other words, faith can't do it. Works props faith up. Guys, this is the mixture gospel message most of us were raised on. And it sounds like this. Come to Jesus. He loves you. He'll forgive you of all of your sins. He'll come into your heart right now. Congratulations. Welcome to the family of God. We'll see you next Sunday. Get ready. Here comes the boom. Next Sunday you walk in. You are no longer a prospect. We don't have anything to sell you. We don't have anything to get from you. You've now become a part of the machine. You now, here, here, here's, we all heard this. We just heard it in different ways. You now have the Spirit of God in you to teach you how to live right. And the Spirit of God in you is going to help you keep the law that you couldn't keep last week. Last week, we said you could come up here and be forgiven. This week, we tell you to come up here and get help. So your sermon at week two ends with, a bunch of you failed this week, you're not doing your part as believers, come on up here and let's pray that God strengthen you to do better next week. It went from, I'll forgive you for all of your stuff, to, I'll help you do better stuff. And in that scenario, grace is not greater. The law and doing right is the highest form of approval in heaven. And the Holy Spirit is in you just to get you a booster. To get up there. If you're a sinner, this is why I always got jealous of sinners. I'm going to admit it. I was raised in church and I was jealous of sinners. Not because they got to sin, but because they got up there so easy. Once, one prayer, and everybody loved them for one week. And I'm not joking with you. I, I used to think when they come up off the altar, I used to think, man, you don't know what you're in for. I mean, it went from awe and admiration to, oh, boy. Boy, you just don't know what you just signed up for. Now, in that scenario, and you go, well, you're sensationalizing a little bit. I am sensationalizing a little bit. I, I realize that. But it's still the same at the core of it. Because our idea about Christianity is that Christianity is about doing the right thing. Christianity has never been about doing the right thing. It's about him living his life through you. It's not about doing the right thing. So in that argument, what's, most, what's the bigger thing? The Spirit of God or the law of God? The law of God. It's the pinnacle. And the Spirit's just a booster. In James's argument of salvation, what's the bigger thing, faith or works? Works. He says your faith is just this, but if you can get up there, that's works is how people are going to know that you are who you say you are. Now, I want to defend James for a second, okay? Before, I help, before we close with talking about Paul, and what, how James thought about Paul. I want to defend James. Guys, James is a Jew who is desperately trying to preserve the identity of his people in a world in which his people are facing imminent danger. He's a good pastor. His doctrine isn't quite right, but it's the best he knows. So what he's trying to do is he says, to the 12 tribes scattered abroad, listen up. We're being slaughtered, man. You're going through persecution. This is how he opens the book. We're going through hell on earth. Guys, we got to tighten the screws. 
you're becoming indiscernible from the unbeliever. We're losing our identity as a people. And if we don't restore our identity, there's not going to be anything left of what we used to be. To James, the young firebrand Paul must have been seen as a threat to all things Jewish. And he was the most dangerous James had ever heard because he was the best at being Jewish. And that's what made him so dangerous. Is he knew Torah. He knew what it said. And yet he'd still stand on the street corner and say, it can't save you. It won't save you. You don't even have to live according to it. I'll show you a better way, and it's called faith in Jesus. And while James very much believed in having faith in Jesus, James very much believed that the better was to have faith in Jesus and be a good Jew. The spirit of James is still alive and well in the American church. In the American church, we are infatuated with all things Jewish because it means they're closer to God. I mean, my prayers would be heard if I had a good prayer shawl. Our worship would go further if we would blow the shofar horn. If we would observe Passover while serving Jesus, we would have a greater, more tangible anointing in our worship because we would be doing it the way God intended it to be done with the beauty of Jesus. And in that situation, Judaism is higher and Jesus is a support system to get you to the higher thing. And where James and Paul went down separate roads, this is how I believe James felt about Paul. Paul is trying to make a people of God outside of God's people. James would have told you God's people are the Jews. And Paul, what's wrong with Paul is he's trying to make a people of God outside of God's people. And that's dangerous for God's people. So James is a mother hen, writing to 12 tribes scattered. He does not attack Paul because there is no Paul. It's an idea. But James sees it coming down the road. This idea that people could be, could have this without displaying it. And James never attacks Gentiles in this letter as being incapable of salvation because he didn't believe that. He knew the stories of his own brother and how he touched those who were not Jewish. And even touched, for lack of a better term, bad Jews. That was Jesus. He didn't, he didn't have to be good at it for him to accept. And James knew that. While he does not attack Gentiles receiving the gospel, I think James is very leery of the lackadaisical attitude that Gentile Christians show towards the Mosaic law. And for James, it's the ultimate insult to the holiness of God. It's why in Acts 15, he says, we've got to give them something to do because they're making us all look bad. I don't think we realize, I know we don't realize, I just, we just cannot, I cannot comprehend how fragile the early church was in, this, in that book of Acts. How close to absolute ruin it came. And this is going to sound strange, but James may have saved. Go with me on this. James may have saved the early church by separating it. Because he very early on pushed the church into two directions. Those of you who think that we should be holding the law and be very Jewish with our Jesus, and those of you who think our salvation comes only by faith, we can ignore the law. We can't coexist in the same room. So go read the book of Acts and you'll catch this amazing thing. James and the rest of the apostles take, I think it's about the ninth chapter, eighth or ninth chapter, they take Paul and Barnabas and they put them on a boat and they send them away for a year and a half. And the Bible says, and there was peace in all of the churches and they flourished. Poor Paul. <laughs> The only way we're going to make it is if we can get rid of this little guy. So they stick him on a boat and they send him away. Now what they didn't realize is that when they send him away, 
when he comes back, oh my gosh, he's got it. He comes back and calls it my gospel. He does. He comes back and says, the gospel that he gave me, if you preach any other gospel, he said, you're in trouble. And he was, he was at that, from that point on, uh, Peter gets to the end of his letter and says, concerning the epistles of our brother Paul, they're hard to understand, but I implore you, try. Peter caught it and said, I don't know all what he's talking about sometimes. He's firing out stuff and I'm going, whoa, I'm not sure about that. But what I do know is I see Jesus in it. Peter put his seal of approval on it. Peter had a right to do that. Peter saw Jesus. It was kind of Peter saying, this guy's got something. He's got something unique, got something special. So, I, I want to reiterate this. James is very concerned with a Jewish Christian remaining Jewish. He concedes early on that Gentiles should not be bound to the law, but he very much feels that Jews are chosen first and they ought to act like they're chosen first. And that since Jews came up under the law, they've been redeemed from its curse by Jesus, but that they ought to do honor to their heritage by trying to keep the law. That was James's feeling. That's his heartbeat. Now, I can't help it. I blatantly and patently disagree. <laughs> I do not believe that we should continue to try and keep the law, when Paul would call it the ministry of death and the ministry of condemnation. But please understand when you read the book of James, rather than seeing an all-out war between two apostles that did not exist, see it as the early days of an apostle who all of his life, all the way through the book of Acts, struggles with freeing the Jew from the trappings of the law. But he never went so far as to say, you have to keep it in order to be saved. But he did go so far as to say, it will, it is a sign of your justification. It is. And, and, I, and we see Paul would take it to a level that James would never, could never take it. And for me, it's encouraging because it says there's room to grow. There's room to develop. And it also causes you to, to investigate. And this is a careful, just a careful study of the word will show you this. Actually, it doesn't have to be that careful. Read the book of Acts and watch who the Holy Spirit follows. As the book goes on, who does he follow? Paul. Read the epistles and find out who most of them are authored by. Paul. So it's the Holy Spirit telling you this is the direction that the new covenant will go. And then when you read somebody like James and you've been so saturated in Paul, it doesn't go down right. There's a reason it doesn't go down right. He didn't know you were going to read this book. He was not writing to a Gentile Christian. He was writing to a Jewish one whom he was very concerned was forgetting their roots. And he saw it as a problem in the world. I want to say this as I close. He says in verse 19, you believe there's one God, you do well, even the devils believe and tremble. The Jews would say, our Lord is one Lord. That was the mantra they would quote every day. Our Lord is one Lord. And James is wanting them to go beyond the mantra and live that out. He says, even the demons believe it. And I have a theory that this is James's rebuttal to those who are starting to go back and deny Jesus. This wouldn't be near as big of a deal until about A.D. 67, A.D. 68. But maybe this is the early argument against denying Jesus and claiming Yahweh so that you could get out of persecution. By the time the book of Hebrews come, that was rampant. Jewish Christians would deny, they would just say Yahweh is God, and the Romans would leave him alone because the Jews had an exemption. They paid high taxes for that exemption. But they had an exemption against saying Caesar is God. Christians, though, wouldn't say Yahweh is God because they were Gentiles, most of them. And for them, they didn't have Moses looming over them, teaching them about Yahweh. All they had was Jesus. So when they were cornered, they would say, there is no God but Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And the Romans would throw them in the prison and <laughs> cut their heads off. Throw them into the Colosseum and in front of the lions and all those things, all those stories that you've heard. That would come later, but this could have been the seedbed of that moment in that, in that argument. Okay? Paul would ultimately die. I told you we'd finish with this. Paul would ultimately die. 
the establishment that brought him up would kill him because Paul was deemed a traitor to Moses and to the cause. A Pharisee of Pharisees who left the Pharisees. And ultimately, I think it was Galatians 3 that would get Paul giving the most trouble because he would live out in Christ there are neither Jew nor Gentile, bond nor free, male nor female. He lived that out, and that got him killed because he, he said there's no difference. Every man is the same in God. you got to come in through Jesus. And that, to this day, to this day, the most controversial thing you can do in church is just point people to Jesus. Isn't that amazing? To this day, the most controversial thing you can do, get them out of their clubs and their cliques and their cell phone buddies and their accountability partners and give them Jesus, and that'll get you fired in most places. Don't bring them in and tell them how to live, and that'll get you fired in most places. Tell them they have the Holy Spirit and they ought to do whatever Jesus tells them to do. Tell them to break tradition from the church. Don't do what they grew up thinking they were supposed to do. Do what Jesus tells you to do. That'll get you fired in most places. The, the worst advice you can give people is, whatever Jesus tells you to do, do it. Because they might. I dare you. Whatever he tells you to do, Midland, do it. It's a daring way to live. It's an awesome way to live. Praise God. All right, would you stand? Started at 7.02, end at 8.02. Right on the money. Say a prayer for us from time to time, if you would. This is always home to us. This is where I hold my ordination. This is where uh, we refer people to. Uh, this, is, this is my home church, and always will be, as long as, especially as long as my dad is here, but as long as most of you are here, I'll consider it our home church. We'll be stopping in from time to time and uh, hopefully preaching from time to time uh, in this pulpit. Uh, you have a bright, bright future ahead of you. I, I know it. And I, I believe that God's already begun to stir it in his people in this house. I know he's already stirring it in your pastor. That, that good things are on your horizon. We believe in God for you. You're always in our heart and always in our prayer. And I know that you feel the same way about us. There are offering plates here. Give as you, you go tonight. And, and be blessed. Father, we thank you, we praise you, we glorify you because you're worth it. Because the word says rejoice evermore and I'm learning that you can be stressed out all the time over stuff you cannot control or you can rejoice evermore that it's already finished in heaven. I choose to do that. I thank you that you show us that your Bible characters are not perfect. <laughs> that they have some issues and they don't have everything figured out. And that you were so cool with that, you let them write stuff down, even though later there'd be a change of heart. I, that encourages me, because I still got old CDs where I, that I don't want to listen to, of stuff that I said. And Father, I thank you that you kept anointing me and blessing me in spite of myself. And I'm thanking you that you're still doing that now, in spite of myself. And Father, I know in your people that's an encouragement, so we thank you for that. And we're not asking for it to continue that we don't know what we're talking about. We're asking for revelation of your glory, of your grace, of your love, of your favor. And when we see it, Father, may we be living sacrifices. Sacrifice our pride and do what you say do. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.